All right, this is the uh, Data Science Learning Community uh, Web APIs with R Book Club. Uh, this is for my in-progress book um, that hopefully will be coming out. Uh, we'll see whether we make it or whether I make it end of this year or sometime next year. Um, and today we are in what is currently chapter seven, uh, scrape data from web pages. So our learning objectives this week are to decide whether to scrape data from a web page, because that's the first thing we need to figure out. And I guess I should back up scraping a web page just means programmatically processing the web page to extract data in a usable format. Um, a silly uh, personal pet peeve on that is people write scrapping a lot that they're going to scrap a web page with two P's and uh, it, it's just, that's not what it is. You're going to scrape the web page. Scrapping the web page kind of means the opposite. It means throwing it away and scraping means you're going to keep it. Anyway, uh, that's no big deal, but uh, it can be a single page or it can be several pages. So um, a lot of times if I'm doing something for Tidy Tuesday, I'll end up scraping uh, like I just did this for this week, uh, scraping an entire website, like many, many web pages from it. Um, and so that's part of what scraping involves. Um, so we're going to decide whether to to do that. Like, is it uh, legal? Is it something you something worth doing? Um, are there easier ways to do it? We're going to learn to use the polite package to kind of responsibly scrape web pages to avoid like overwhelming a website. Um, and we're going to do, um, a little bit of scraping complex data structure. We're actually going to do quite a bit of scraping complex data structures from web pages. Um, and then we're going to do a little bit of scraping content that requires interaction. This is a very, um, experimental, uh, thing within the RVS package. There was a previous iteration of it and he has updated it in the new version, um, I, I didn't get quite as far into detailing how to do that as I would like, but partly it's because it's a little bit iffy and it's very, very dependent on the website that you're using, but we'll see how to do that and kind of how to uh, experiment. That whole section, my plan is to go to um, our studio to kind of demonstrate that so we can play around a little bit. Um, so, um, I, I have the list of packages that we're going to use. I actually missed some that I'm going to end up using for cleaning the data. We'll see a little blurb of that. Um, I don't want to focus too much on the cleaning part because there are lots of books about cleaning. Um, I did, oh, and I guess you know, related that I did kind of the preview of this chapter uh, on Friday in our R4DS book club. And so I'll link to that in uh the YouTube video, <clears throat> there's chapter 24 of R for Data Science is about web scraping. I'm trying to primarily in this uh, demonstration or in this chapter, focus on things that aren't covered in that chapter. So we'll talk a little bit about some things that are covered there, but we're going to get into some more uh, complicated things. Now, if you haven't seen that, I will still be going over what I'm doing. I just am going to go a little faster than I otherwise would. So anyway, so we use this polite package. We're definitely going to be using the RVEST package. Under the hood, RVEST is actually using XML2. And to do the interactive stuff, you have to install the Chromote package. Um, RVEST suggests that, but the interactive stuff doesn't work unless you install that. Um, something to note while we're going through this is that after you like have the web page and when you're actually parsing the web page, all of the parsing applies exactly the same if you get HTML responses from APIs and actually also if you get XML responses from APIs. And so all of this still applies um, even if you don't have to scrape other than this first section about how to decide whether to scrape and how to get the actual um, site. All right. So first thing you need to do is decide whether it's worthwhile to actually scrape the site. Um, and the very, the first piece of that is decide, do you need to scrape this, the data, uh, as we have seen through the rest of this book, the first thing you should do is look for an API. If there's a way to access this data in a more preferred form, um, 
then do that. Uh, that's the way that the website is intending for you to get access to bigger bulks of data generally. Uh, the next chapter is going to be all about kind of how to look for the API. Um, if it's a little bit hidden, um, how to look within the like code of the website itself or look uh, you know different places. We're gonna see a little bit about that on, uh, I think it's the next slide, but um, much more next chapter. Um, but also there's a package data pasta. If you're just like getting one table or a few tables that you're getting from websites, it's not something you need to automate. Uh, this package has RStudio add-ins. You can actually set up uh, hotkeys with some other uh, functionality if, to where you could just paste, you know, copy the table and paste it and you'll make a tibble in your code. Um, and so that's something to look into if you are not like programmatically scraping or, or repeatedly scraping a site, or if you're not scraping, you know, hundreds of web pages or whatever. Um, even if data pasta doesn't work, if you're just doing it once, I have gone down this route where it was some really complicated thing where I had to like log into the site and uh, it was dynamic. And so I had to do all the, you know, really hardcore uh, stuff that we're gonna see at the end of this. And it probably would have been faster to just like one by one copy paste the fields into my uh, script. If you're only doing it once again, you know, think about that kind of thing. Don't waste all your time trying to figure out how to make it work with a scrape if you don't really need to do that. Um, and just uh, for this last bullet, I, I just when you're doing this, try not to scrape. You know, if you need 10 of the pages, don't scrape all thousand of them or that kind of thing. We're going to talk a little bit about that um, sort of thing. But uh, this is going to lead into a later bullet, but uh, you don't want to hit the server more than you really need to. Uh, especially if it's like a website you like, if you uh, repeatedly are calling the page, you could, depending how they're set up, you could basically use up their hosting budget. Um, and so the website might die because you tried to scrape it. Now, it's very, very unlikely for that to happen, but if it's a very small website or if you're really slamming it, uh, you could break it up, break it. So, um, <laughs> I will not be doing the how to impolitely scrape websites that you don't like, like uh, the joke in the chat. Uh, that is a thing that people do. It's called a denial of service attack or a distributed denial of service attack, DDoS. We don't want to do that. Um, so yeah, and that kind of does lead into, can I legally scrape this data? That's the next thing you need to be thinking about. Um, First thing to check is websites often will have legal disclaimers about how you can use them. Um, I'm not a lawyer. So if you are doing this for money or um, you know doing this a lot, you might wanna consult a lawyer, but just know that sometimes or fairly often really, the uh, legal disclaimers are gonna lean towards being overprotective. They're gonna say, oh no, you absolutely can't scrape this data when legally they can't stop you in some cases. And so uh, just be aware of that. Um, but again, don't, uh, you know, don't slam the page and, and I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> All right. Within the US, um, an important thing to know is you can't copyright facts. So if you're worried about copyright, um, if it's just like a list of information that isn't copyrightable, you possibly could be liable if you're like using up their bandwidth, but not for the using the uh, the facts. Um, you can, however, copyright like collections of facts in some cases. There has to be some creative use. I did a Tidy Tuesday data set all about all the fair use law or case law in the United States back in August of last year when I was first working on this chapter because I wanted to try to learn this stuff a little bit better. So that is available um, and the link is in this uh, slide deck. Um, outside the US, uh, sometimes it's stricter. The European, European, yeah, European Union um, has more protections for database creators and also for like user generated data. 
Um, in general, you want to be a little bit careful about user generated data because there might be, um, you know, extra copyright issues there where maybe the, uh, each piece of data is owned by someone else. And so that becomes a whole different headache for you to deal with. Um, sometimes it is more lax. Uh, you know, there are countries that don't really enforce copyright laws. And so if you're scraping from them, it's probably not going to be that big of a deal. Um, and if you're using it for just your own personal use um, or uh, nonprofit educational use, usually that's okay. Again, all of these have big asterisks and consult a lawyer if you're uh, concerned about that. And then the last bullet I wanted to call out is if it's personally identifiable information, you know, names, addresses, phone numbers, social security numbers, activity of where someone was at some time, or all these different things that could track or lead to a specific person, just be careful about that. Uh, you know, really don't scrape that unless you really need to and you have a good reason and it's legally clear and all that. So personally identifiable information is where you're most likely to get into trouble scraping anything. And that's kind of true of everything in data. All right. And then the last piece kind of related to this is, should I scrape this data? Just, you know, is it nice to do this? Um, Something useful to know about is there are these, or there can be robots.txt files or robots.txt. I'm going to open up a couple of them. Um, these are files that will usually be at the root of the site. So like github.com slash robots.txt. This one nicely has information about their API. And so that's something I wanted to point out is this can be a way to discover APIs. If you have a website you like, Check their robots.txt and do like you know control F for API um, and see if it mentions APIs in there because often it will. It happens that both of these uh, talk about here's how you can find our API and here's how you might want to use it instead of uh, scraping our website. So um, that's useful. Um, GitHub has this crawl delay and so um, Wikipedia might as well. Um, uh, it doesn't, but it like tells you what to do. Um, that is basically how long to wait between pages. And so, uh, you know, that, that'd be useful. And then other than that, you can see there's all these user agent things. User agent star means, um, oh, let me go back here, means everybody. Uh, and so all of this block is telling us for for everybody, don't let, don't scrape these certain pages. Uh, you're allowed to scrape this one certain page within that. And then don't scrape like login, things like that. So it's telling you what not to do. Uh, Wikipedia has a lot of uh, specific rules for specific user agents because they've found different ones that do just, you know, bad things. And so they block certain ones. Um, now, to my knowledge, this uh it isn't it doesn't automatically mean just from a robots.txt saying that it's disallowed it doesn't automatically mean that that user agent is going to be blocked um but it means that they might block them it's kind of giving you information and saying hey if you are this user agent please don't you are breaking our website and so uh when you come to one of these robots files you, you search for the names of packages that you might be using to do the scraping search for uh, any other keywords related to what you're doing. So, you know, search for Arvest, for example, search for polite when we see using polite. Um, if you've been using your own user agent, like we talked about a few chapters ago, um, you can search for yourself, see if you have been blocked uh, or if you've been asked not to search, scrape certain pages. So that would be, it. hopefully they will have contacted you, but uh, that is something to look for. Um, you can look for specific pages within the site. So like this has all these star slash star slash pulse. So if you're wanting to scrape these pulse pages, oh no, you're not, not supposed to do that. And so if you have a specific thing you're trying to look for or trying to scrape, you should check on that. Um, you should look at the root of the site and then also look at, you know, if you're trying to scrape somewhere deeper into the site, just replace the last thing in the URL <clears throat> with robots.txt, sometimes they'll have an extra uh, version 
looked at that place deeper, so it's good to check that. Um, these aren't necessarily legally binding or even like programmatically binding, but they are telling you the wishes of the website. And so keep that in mind. Sorry, I need to take a drink. And then um, finally on robots, uh, there is a robots text package that will automatically parse those robots.txt files. And more importantly, there's this polite package that we're going to talk about quite a lot that wraps around that robots.txt or robots text package and like automatically applies those rules. Um, and so we'll see a lot about how that works. Um, and I'm seeing if I have any other notes. Um, no, I think we covered everything else that I wanted to talk about there. All right. So get, with that all in mind, um, so yes, so uh, there's a question in the chat. So these robot robots.txt files are in a standard format. Um, I actually, yes, I did. I kind of learned that by digging into write this chapter, this format with the user agent and then disallow, that is what is expected. Now you can have all the spaces you want within there. Um, they have the hash comments. And so you can have all kinds of different comments. The Wikipedia one, the reason I pulled it up as an example is if you look at the scroll bar over here, it's just, there's a ton in the Wikipedia one. It's a good one to kind of look at for how it could work. Um, there are like specific pages that they don't allow specific user agents to scrape. Um, there are specific pages that they don't want anyone to scrape because, uh, you know, they have caused problems in the past or whatever. And so um, that's it's uh, interesting to see. They can also like sometimes they'll have weird random things in them. Um, but oh, and that is interesting then. The, yeah, so the Wikipedia not only has a robust.txt file, but it has a robust.txt article about the file. Um, so I will definitely have to look into that more deeply later. All right. So given all that, we are going to uh, use the polite package to scrape a website. Um, or to, uh, polite package and Arvest uh, and the site we're going to scrape is we're going to look at this cheese.com, which if you uh, saw Tidy Tuesday this week, um, this is what I did for Tidy Tuesday because I was trying to write this or make these slides. And so I found a website to make the slides from. Uh, this website is actually in the like examples for the polite package. But it was interesting to see because uh, it was a good demo of how you shouldn't write scraping code and then assume it'll work forever because the dem the examples in the polite package website uh, don't actually work anymore as far as I could follow. So yeah, I had to update some things. They also didn't like go deep into the whole site. Um, so we're going to be looking at this uh, uh, Castelmagno cheese uh, page. So here's the original. It's got a bunch of ads on it and I'm trying to get this table so we can just look at the image here um, or not table. So it's this list of data. Each cheese web page on this site has one or more of these things. It doesn't necessarily have all of them. And we're not going to um, like do every iteration uh, today just because I ran out of time to get there. But we'll see um, kind of how you can automatically do this for Probably the next iteration of this chapter. If you know, if you're watching this in the future and wondering why you can't find this in my book, um, I'm probably going to just host my own pages that are kind of like this, but that I can be certain will never change. Um, and so, there may be a different example here uh, in the future. Um, and yeah, if you look at the cleaning script in Tidy Tuesday for this week, uh, it is this, but it is. Like I learned a lot since I did that and I would do it quite a bit differently now. So um, kind of take what I say today and kind of imagine it applied to the Tidy Tuesday and we'll see what I mean by that. All right. Um, so there are basically three steps for scraping with web or with Arvest and Polite kind of plugs into one of those steps. Um, 
again, see that R4DS chapter 24 web scraping for the full introduction to Arvest, but the idea is Arvest is for harvesting web pages or harvesting in uh, Kiwi English. Um, and the steps that we want to do, do are um, load the page. So in some way you want to load like the actual HTML the same way that the um, that your browser loads the page. Then you want to find objects, um, observations and variables that you want in that web page. And then extract the variables from those things into our objects. Now, if you look at these, this is the, or sorry, this is the only step that is really scraping per se, because you could get the page back from an API. This could, so once you have the page, uh, in a response, whether that is via scraping or via using an API, um, then you look inside of it and get out the pieces you want. So you want to parse that HTML tree and find the stuff you want. Um, when we're extracting variables, I say that they're text here because you're getting back just a text file and HTML is just a text file. So even if you're trying to scrape um, like images, eventually you'll be downloading those images, but first you have to scrape the URL of the image and then go download it. And so everything you get back when you're scraping the web page is gonna be text. Um, yeah, and Arvest does have like, uh, if you are scraping just tables of data, Arvest has some shortcuts and that's a lot of what I covered in the, um, when I did the slides for R4DS. Uh, so we're going to go kind of past that. We're not going to do the easy stuff. All right. So the first thing we want to do today is work with this polite package. Um, polite is a really useful package for kind of being respectful and, and um, you know, not uh, breaking websites. But the light or the docs are a little bit on the light side. Um, <laughs> I put a note in here that I'm resisting the urge to rewrite the whole package with hitter two because it's written in hitter and and like make the documentation better and make it work a little bit better, but it works pretty well. And so uh, we'll leave it as is for now. Um, Polite has, well, it has, I don't know, like 10 functions, but we're going to talk about three of them today, two of them on this slide, and then... Uh, Actually, I don't think I get to the third one today, but we I'll try to mention it at least. Um, first one is bow. Uh, so um, they work on this on this phrase bow and scrape. It means, you know, like be subservient. If you bow and scrape, you're being subservient. So the first thing you do is you bow. Um, and this function is expecting a URL, um, a user agent, and something that isn't documented by found by looking through the code that uh, you want to set this because if you set it if you leave it at the default um, there is some code that just looks for the word polite or it looks for the um, like the handle of the author of the polite package and if each, either of those appear in the user agent field then he sets some extra limits because he doesn't want himself to get blocked from websites and so if you're trying to scrape really fast and you know kind of you've read the robots.txt and you're pretty confident that it's okay to scrape fast, uh, make sure you change this because otherwise this delay of five seconds per page. So if you're scraping a bunch of pages, it'll wait five seconds before scraping the next one. Uh, that it becomes hard coded effectively if you leave it as polite. Um, and if you're scraping a lot of data, five seconds can be uh, a long time. So that's something that you'll want to change. I actually note that um, I would consider setting this down to zero when you're doing real things other than if robots.txt tells you not to do that or you know lower than five, like a second between pages, 10th of a second, I think um, either GitHub or maybe Wikipedia, uh, somewhere that I saw was set at a 10th of a second delay. And so that's something you might want to look for. Um, times is like retries that we saw uh, uh, back a ways with uh, hitter two. 
I think I also said, yeah, three is fine. It's just, it's saying if it fails, try again, try one more time and then give up. And so that's what the times is. So that's saying if you get some sort of transient error that it's saying, um, you know, this page doesn't exist, try it a couple of times in case something was just weird and then give up on it. So force, um, what this will do, so hitter or um, polite uses this package memoize, uh, which is memoize is a like computer science concept. It just basically means if you call a function again with the same inputs, so the same arguments, it won't run the function again. It will just use a cached result. Um, that's really useful if you're scraping web pages because if you happen to go back to the same web page, if you you know you go to the same URL, uh, Polite will automatically, unless you tell it otherwise, it'll automatically just use the copy that you already have in your RAM instead of scraping instead of calling the website again. Um, so um, this is so. There's a question of uh, like what <laughs> what's going on here. Um, this is kind of setting you set yourself up to scrape. So this is what it's going to do is it's going to go read the robots text file and it's going to kind of set up a, here's what I'm allowed to do at this site. And then later we're going to see how to um, iterate and how to, how to go through a bunch of different uh, values. Um, and so we'll see that in the next part. Partially, I don't have the example pulled up, but if you look at the tidy Tuesday, uh, use case, then it has a lot of iteration within it. Um, and then finally, so verbose by default is false. If you're doing this interactively, I would recommend setting this to true. Um, in case there are weird things happening, you want it to tell you, and it largely won't tell you what happened if, um, if you're not verbose, or it won't tell you that it's retrying or things like that. And so uh, I would set that to true. Um, and then there are dots that, uh, as far as I remember, they're not ever actually used for anything. So um, it's just there for if they want to expand in the future. And then the other half, kind of to answer Kevin's question, is scrape. So after you have this bow, you'll you'll save this and you'll use this as the thing you're going to scrape. So that's the session you opened up. And you can have this query parameter, um, which is like we've seen with hitter two, where you, you're setting the stuff after the question mark in the URL. And so that's where you can take the same bow and then do different queries and get different scrape results. Um, and so that's why, uh, so that's why the delay matters that it will wait between those different scrape results. Um, even if you're calling them kind of separately, it's like, no, this session's not ready. And so it's look, watching your clock and not letting you call it until you're ready again. Um, Except in content, you probably don't need to set those. Though, in weird cases, you might uh, not be looking for HTML, or you might be looking for only a certain MIME type, which we talked a little bit about um, two weeks ago. Um, I would just leave those as default almost all the time. And then again, verbose is false by default, but I would set that to true uh, to know why something is going weird. Um, the third function that uh, we're not going to get to today, I don't think, from I don't think I got that into my code. There's also nod, which is where you take a bow and just change the URL. Um, so if you want to go to a different um, page within the same site, it will check. Oh, what do we already know in our in our bow? So in the thing that we scraped originally, what do we know about that? Does this new page have any different rules that weren't in the original bow? Um, and so it does kind of just a check to make sure that page is okay. Uh, and so um, that's kind of like update the base that we're using. So, you know, update our bow and then maybe do queries against that. Um, and again, we'll kind of see examples of that. There are more examples in the Tidy Tuesday. All right. So to see actual use case, uh, we're going to set up our session. Using polite, we're going to bow to this cheese.com slash Castelmagno, uh, Castelmagno uh, page. And I set up my own user agent. 
saying that I'm using Arvest and that I, you know, here's my name and here's my email address. I throw this plus user agent in there so I can easily search Gmail in, in case I get a bunch of them. Um, again, for this page, I set delay equals zero and verbose equals true. And so when I set uh, set this up and then print the session, it actually tells me, oh, robots.txt doesn't have any rules for this particular case, which I thought it was kind of funny that he uses that as the demo on his site, but um, it works fine. Uh, and again, so crawl delay zero seconds, what that's gonna tell you is, okay, if I said, had said zero, but the robots.txt said three, then this would say you're gonna delay three seconds. Um, so it's kind of trying to find the uh, least rude rule to use. And then finally, it just says the path is scrapable for this user agent. So we're good to go. We can use this. And so then we can just take that and use scrape on that session. We don't need any other arguments because we're not sending in any query parameters or anything. And now this is like the actual page. We now have downloaded the page, done that first load the page step. Um, let me know, you know, feel free to butt in if uh, anything isn't making sense here, but I do want to try to get through this. So, all right. The next step, this is where we start getting into real, um, you know, uh, tricksiness of, uh, oh, I did already have that open, but whatever. Um, we, now we want to find our, like, find our stuff. Uh, what we're going to try to do is get all of this table. I talked a little bit in R4DS um, about, sorry. Um, generally, what you want to try to do is, you know, first we scrape the whole page because you can't help that. That's how the website sends it to you is it sends the whole page. Then kind of within that, pull out the piece that you need, but kind of the large, the container that you need. So if we look at this, um, in most browsers, you can do some sort of inspect. And uh, it'll show you like, okay, summary milk, yeah, stupid ads. So another useful thing you can do is you can do inspect and just uh, delete and okay, we don't have that ad in the way anymore. All right, so now we can jump to the one we're looking at. Um, summary milk is just the first line. You can see like summary, well, the, the highlighting is a little weird for this because the way the formatting set up, but good enough. Um, but we can see, okay, we have all these different summaries inside of this summary points class. And so that thing seems to be holding all the data we care about. Um, something that is nice when you're doing this inspect thing is I can just hit uh, delete. I just realized you can see this, right? Uh, I'm making sure that you can see the black background thing at the bottom, because sometimes the browser doesn't share like I think it's sharing, but I want to make sure. You can see the console. Yes. OK, this. good. Yeah. <laughs> All right, and so uh, one thing I do sometimes when it's not highlighting very nice like this is you can always reload the page. So, yep, when I delete it, it deleted the whole block of what I wanted. So now I know that is the thing I want. And so I can reload the page and uh, go back in there and say, okay, yes, that was, oh, actually that is not the thing I want. Uh, summary points, there we go. So that UL summary points, that's the thing we want. Um, oh, I did want to show that uh, on those slides that I did on Friday, um, when we are doing this, we're going to be uh, like using a string to talk about what are we selecting. And when we do that, if you just do a word, um, like if we just did, let's go back here. Um, you know, we're trying to get the summary points. If we did UL, that's going to get anything that is the tag named UL. Um, if you put a dot in front, that dot means class. So we do dot summary points. That's this, this things with this class. And then uh, hash um, or pound sign or however you, you know, number sign. And then the word, that means something that has ID as uh that thing. We don't have IDs. Well, we do have up here. Collapse information is the ID. Something to know is that uh, there can only be one thing that has a given ID, but there can be many things that have a given class. And so sometimes if you're trying to select specific pieces, you'll want ID. Conversely, if you're trying to select all the things that are kind of like that, you probably don't want ID when there are lots of things on the page 
and you want to get all of them. Um, and so, oh, um, well, yeah, we'll, so we'll see that in a moment, how that works. Um, the, yeah, the other piece is that there are these two functions in our vest. I went over them pretty deep uh, in R4DS and, and like, you know, that book covers them pretty well. Um, there's HTML elements with an S that will find all of the matches that uh, for whatever you put in there. And then there's HTML element singular without the S that will, um, it, select, it gets the first match, but if you send in a list of elements, it's gonna get one match for each of that list of elements. Uh, we'll see very specific use cases for this in a moment, but just the rule of thumb is normally you're gonna to wanna to do HTML elements uh, plural to get all of the things that match what you're looking for. And then one at a time do element to pull out uh, variables from those things. And so we'll see what that looks like in just a moment. Um, actually, less than a moment <laughs> right now. Uh, and so we're going to take that Castellano page that we uh, loaded with Bow and Scrape and look for all of the elements that are dot summary points. And actually, I went dot li, and I forgot that I was going to do that. That we can see in here that all of the things we want are li underneath that summary points. And so I want each of these pieces, I guess, to back off a little bit and actually look at this. It's like one of those is the milk that it's made out of. One of them is the country that it's from. One is the region that it's from, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and another thing to kind of notice before we go too far is that they each have um, this class summary underscore and then a word or two. So summary milk, summary country, summary region, summary family. The thing after the underscore you might notice is kind of a nice variable name. And so we're going to use that in a moment that we're going to use those classes to give us variable names. So, all right. And once I do this li, or summary points li, we can see that we selected these 15 things, summary milk, summary country, summary region, et cetera. It's hard to see when you print an object with that you're selecting from our vest. It, it does like a summary, um, depending how wide your window is, you can see different amounts of it, but often it's hard to see anything. Um, it's just giving you enough to say, oh yeah, I, I meant to get this LI with this summary milk. And so uh, this looks like it's doing the right thing, but it's just know that it's not giving you, it's not showing you everything that's inside of that. And it can be confusing sometimes because it looks like, you know, you're like, I thought there was all this content inside of there. And I just see, you know, maybe sometimes you'll just see this piece of it. You're like, but I thought there was more and it's, yeah, there is more, but it's like inside of that object and don't be too discouraged by that. All right. Um, yes. All right. And then once we have our things, uh, we're going to go ahead and extract variables out of them. So first thing I want to do is get all of those points. So I take the summary points and there's this function rvest html text two, which is going, uh, the reason there it's two is uh, he made a new cleaner version basically. So HTML text just gets the raw text. HTML text two cleans it up for you. And I think um, almost always you're gonna want this one, the, the text HTML text two that will pull the text out. You know, if we look again at this uh, um, thing, uh, the, this uh, code, Technically inside of this summary region, there's an um, italics section that actually doesn't have any content inside of it. And then there's the paragraph that has region Piedmont. HTML text um, one would be, actually would give the same thing, I think in this case, because it's not, um, there's nothing super weird here, but it, uh, HTML text two, just make sure you clean out any of that extra info. Um, if there are, um, special characters, they get encoded properly when you use HTML text two versus HTML text gives you the raw unencoded characters, um, things like that. But so you almost always want HTML text two. And then I just do a little cleanup. Um, if you do a lot of web scraping, you will get pretty familiar with regex. Uh, and so this is saying start at the beginning of the line and then take anything that is not a colon character. So he, <laughs> 
The fun thing is caret means not inside of brackets, but it means beginning of the line outside of brackets because that's why regex is confusing. Um, asterisk means I want one or more of that kind of thing or zero or more of that. And then we're outside of the brackets. And so I want an actual colon and then a space. And so I'm saying when we look at this actual data, it has like region, colon, space, Piedmont. I don't want region, colon, space. I just want Piedmont. So that's going to, this regex is going to get rid of all of that. We'll see some more cleaning in a minute. Uh, likewise, I, I grab names. And so I'm just making a named vector out of this. So I made my variables and then I'm giving them names. And the way I'm giving them names is using this HTML ATTR. So we go over here. Uh, anything that's inside of the angle brackets in an HTML tag is an attribute. So class is an attribute. And I'm grabbing the attribute named class out of this thing and then removing that from the beginning of the line, summary underscore. The reason I did it this way is if you look at the Tidy Tuesday one, I'm like specifically selecting each of the variables, but um, like Castelmagno does have alternate spellings, but I think there was uh, synonyms is another field that some of the cheese pages have. Sometimes they say synonyms and sometimes they say alt spelling. Um, if I set it up to exactly cut, just select the variables that I see here, I might miss some variables on later pages. And so by using this, uh, just get all of them and then use whatever the class name is as the variable name, um, I'm kind of future proofing on anything else on any other pages we might want to scrape. Um, and then since I have a named vector, one way you can turn that into a tibble is uh, using the bang, bang, bang from uh, tidyverse functions that what that does is takes this named list and expands it out as if you had said named variable equals value. So it like makes it blow up out into uh, a list of arguments. I like to think of it as the bang, the, the three exclamation points are telling you uh, take whatever's after this and turn it into dots inside of my function. So dot, dot, dot becomes this thing just a, kind of an aside there, but that's how I how I chose to make this tibble. Um, and then, you know, we can see I, I kind of, I did a glimpse and uh, abbreviated it here, but we can see that, you know, now we've got all of these variables. They're not pretty, but they're in there. I've got milk uh, made from pasteurized, around pasteurized cows, goats, and sheep's milk. Um, country, region, those look fine. Family looks fine, et cetera. But, you know, okay, maybe I want to clean up the these values, get rid of the units. Um, maybe I want to split these apart into vectors um, and, you know, maybe change these into true or false instead of no. Um, and so I'm going to show the cleaning fairly briefly. I don't want to go or dwell too much on the cleaning because, again, there are many other books, uh, especially all of our for ds is about cleaning data pretty much. Um, so here's that aside. Um, so I take that cheese data, I am converting yes into true and no into false. Um, I'm taking fat and calcium because we saw fat and calcium have these units. And so I'm saying get rid of their units uh, string with a string remove. Um, I'm looking at all the other variables. So I, I've got milk, milk special, calcium special, fat special, vegetarian and vegan are special, but the rest of these can be a list of things. And so I take all of those and split on comma for the word and. Um, and then in the milk, we look up here, you know, it's made from pasteurized or unpasteurized cows, goats, and sheep's milk. Now, I did check that even on the um, non-dairy ones, the vegetarians ones, it'll say like non-dairy apostrophe S milk. So non-dairy's milk. Um, so given that, I uh, am taking anything in milk as well. First, I'm looking for a break, so a, a space, basically, and the word pasteurized. And I count that as it has pasteurized in it. Look for break and then the word unpasteurized. And that means it has unpasteurized. Uh, pull all of the things that have an apostrophe S out um, with anything that doesn't have a space. And so that's this, this extract. 
and I'm going to put those in before milk and then drop milk. So that's keep unused is what's going on there. And if we glimpse that, now we can see that now I have pasteurized, unpasteurized, and animal at the start. And this is a list of three values. Um, everything else has become a list because one, if we're pulling in a lot of these pages, some of these will have one value, some will have two, some will have three. Um, I've converted these over to numbers to double. Uh, I've converted these to logical. I just wanted to quickly show like, Almost always, if you are scraping data from the web, you're then going to have to do some cleaning of some sort. Again, it's not this book's not really about that, but um, I wanted to show an example, and I'll probably show a lot more examples once I have the real book uh, sorted out. Um, but I definitely would recommend R for DS for that. Or uh, there are, I don't know, six or seven hundred Tidy Tuesday data sets, most of which have a clean script in them. And so those are a good place to see how to do some cleaning, uh, not always of web data, but often. Okay. Um, and then I do want to show scraping interactive pages in this last 10 minutes or so. Um, there is this function in the latest version of Arvest, read HTML live. Um, I want to, I'm going to show how to do it. And so the, the website that I'm going to use for this demo is um, hmdb.org, the historical marker database. I used this last year in a tidy Tuesday and um, getting the data was a little bit of a, an adventure. Um, and I'm going to show you like at least the start of how to do it. Um, so if you come in here, you can see that it has this page, but so this is what happens when I first load this page, but it changes like what is on the page when I click. And it if we look at the HTML, like the HTML underneath is changing when I click these things. Um, and so I can't just do a normal RVEST scrape because the page changes. <laughs> like, you know, if I do um if I do this again, where when I just first come in, um, it's just the state of Virginia. Um, I don't know why it's just Virginia. Actually, I I, I don't know, but it's it, it is selecting Virginia and actually like one city inside of Virginia. And so if I just loaded this raw from uh, Arvest, maybe I would see that. And I think I don't even see it that much because it needs to um, do some processing before that data exists. So we're going to see a little bit about how to do that. Um, <laughs> I did find it interesting that, um, you know, they do have that, this is the one, it has a crawl delay on it. We're not gonna get to that point where we need to use polite, but it's uh, another example where, um, you know, it's worth no noting, they want us to do a little bit of a delay between each scrape. So that's good to know. Um, and now we're gonna do a little bit of live coding. So if you come back later, this data is in the notes, like you can see, uh, what I'm about to go through in the live coding, but um, we're going to switch over to our studio, hopefully. And let me make sure that you can see. Yes. Okay. I made my font really big, so hopefully you can actually see what we're doing. And this is that um, RVEST read HTML live. So for this, uh, um, the word session, that just means like um, it, it's what is generally used for internet, uh, like one usage. So one user going to a page has a session until they leave the page or close their browser or time, get timed out. And so I'm gonna create my session. It takes a second. And this is like loading that page and it's actually loading it into a uh, invisible instance of Chrome in the background on my computer. And so it's actually loading it as if I'm a person loading it, not as if I'm just hitting their API to load it. Um, I did want to pull this up that, you know, these have this experimental tag on them and they, the help's okay, but it's fairly, fairly new. Um, within this down here somewhere, it tells you that it's going to be making this live HTML object. And so this also has a lot of info we're going to, look into that a little bit. But one of the things it tells you is that this session 
it's an R6 object. It's a weird um, special R object, but it has this function like built into itself where you can view it. And if I call this crazy thing is this is like, this is the web browser of what R is seeing. So this is the instance of the web browser that R is playing with. It's showing us an example. Um, and I'll show you how crazy that is in just a moment. But uh, just to look at this, like, you know, if we look here, um, this, it happens that this object in the, the second column is called the states list, uh, state as in um, country. And so we can see that it has USA and Canada because that's what is selected at the top there. Um, and there's a, um, the whole list of countries that we can pull up with certain weird uh, selectors. Um, so we can see that there are all these countries. But the first country is USA, second country is Canada. And this session, you can click, you can send it a click command. And again, we're using, this is a CSS selector, just like what we use to pull out an element to look at. You can also say, click that element, that specific one that I want you to call. Um, this one, it's a, it's like, this means it's uh, take the first table row and then the first child inside of that table row and click the uh, element that is that has the class country arrow. Okay, and if I guess if we look over here, first row, first element, that country arrow right there. And so when I click that, again, remember that uh, this says US and Canada, if I do states list before I click, and then I click it, and then I do exactly the same command, and now it says United States of America. And if we look at our page, now it has selected United States of America. And so it's like actually interacting with the web page. Um, if I then click the second one, so nth child two instead of one, um, that means two as in row two, and we can see when I clicked it, now it's Canada. And you know, we can see that over in R as well, that it is Canada. Um, and then there's like, you know, these, I had to do some investigation to find where are, what are these buttons? And uh, we'll look at uh, those, those are, you know, that's the list of all the um, provinces in this case. Um, and then there's an, a, there, the third thing doesn't exist. There is no counties list, but if I click the state sidebar and then load the side, counties list, yep, there it is. It's got Manitoba in it. And so um, this is, again, it's only changing the load the page step, um, but it lets you do lots of things in the load the page step because you can keep changing what is loaded. But past that, you can just use HTML element, HTML elements, HTML text to grab objects. So this is the list of you know, all these things that are in this sidebar. Or you know, importantly, I could grab all of the uh, hrefs, all of the, the links that those lead to within the uh, sidebar. And so that's like a way to, to get all the data in this case, this would be getting me a list of other pages that I would then load up and scrape and maybe have to do interactively. I think in this case, I don't have to do interactive. Uh, thankfully, once you have done the um, the setup. Uh, but you could see, like, I would want to scrape this, you know, get this list and then have it click a different one and get the new list and have it click a different one and get the new list. Um, and so that is a interesting way to work with this. So the reason, part of the reason that I didn't get this into notes exactly is there are some weirdnesses. Um, I wanted to show some of the other things you can do in this, but it doesn't actually work. Um, so there is this button. Uh, if we look, you know, up here, there's this, you can enter something and search. And I was like, Ooh, can we get that to work with, uh, with this live session. And so I can say session type and into that object that, sorry, the, that input object that I identified as, um, you know, this info here, I wanna type the word API. Uh, and so when I do that, again, if we look, you can barely see in there, 
that it has API now into that search field. If I click the search button, that breaks my session. And so we can't quite keep going all the way, but if we look here, it did actually just like load a brand new page. Um, I think what's happening is anytime you actually go to a new page, the live session breaks um, and you can ignore this. This is where I was experimenting to try to find uh, if it was salvageable, but um, there's a lot you can do. <laughs> and it's, I, I did have a tidy Tuesday once where I had to kind of go into this and do some surgery uh, to, to pull some things out of it. Um, but if you're not trying to go quite, quite as, yeah, quite as crazy, all of this stuff actually worked. And it was something where I could actually scrape data, even though the, um, if, if I do it, you know, the normal way, which I guess I should have shown, um, I do just like rvest read HTML and then do the same page. Um, yeah. And then do like, you know, the states list, for example. Um, I'm not sure. Yeah, see, it doesn't have any states if I do it just as a normal read HTML because it doesn't have, those don't exist until it loads the page. The the page we're getting back, you know, if we just look at the HTML, I think it's going to be um, almost empty or like it has a head, a source, and a little, you know, a little bit of code in it, but it doesn't have um, this all this data that the uh, live version has. And so um, it's just interesting. It's a way to do, I think a lot of the stuff um, kind of that we've talked about, like Kevin had examples of things he wanted to be able to scrape, probably could do this. Um, so uh, yeah, I guess I didn't dig into that, that in HTML element or HTML elements or oops, or some of the other um, things, what you are typing is either uh, CSS selector or XPath. Um, both of those, I have links in the R4DS slides. Um, I recommend like you can, you can use either one and CSS is more generally useful for the most part. I mean, there are other things that use XPath, but if you learn CSS, you can use that for, uh, Quarto and R Markdown and Shiny, um, Versus if you learn XPath, you can learn, use that for, there are things, but less, there are less use cases for it. Um, now, you probably aren't going to be using the weird selectors like the nth child, or um, like this is selecting things that have an attribute that with the name of search for, like normally you're not going to be using that kind of CSS in, uh, in um, styling of things. Uh, but it's still, it's much more useful, I think, to learn. And um, W3 Schools has a lot of, uh, has a whole tutorial section on CSS selectors. And um, there's also, R4DS has the link to the selector gadget. Rvest also talks about selector gadget, which is like a JavaScript, a uh, little bit of JavaScript code that you can set up as a bookmark. And it will um, like help you find what the names are. I think it's useful. It's useful to be able to use it, but it's also useful to be able to kind of overrule it because it's not smart. <laughs> and so if you're trying to, you know, like if you know that you're inside of this particular table, you can set that yourself and not have to do the weird complicated things that it does that are very fragile. Um, and so I, I do think those are worth learning. Again, I uh, don't think I have room to do a full tutorial on every bit of them within the book, but I, I will definitely have a table and uh, some links uh, because there are um, there's a lot you can do there. And, and like I said, it still works even if you get XML back, uh, XML or HTML back from an API. All of this stuff still works past that. Um, all that changes is what goes in here. Uh, if you look at actually. Uh, so HTML element is using use method HTML element, and we can look that RVS HTML element has you know live HTML <clears throat> RVS session, which is the old way of doing it. Um, 
that's not the one but one of these has uh that you can do responses because it's like it knows that it wants to be able to work with um i don't know where it is anymore anyway that uh sometimes you're going to be using responses uh directly into these oh i think it's the xml2 versions of these things because technically all of this stuff is uh uh xml no anyway i don't know what it is but it's <laughs> um it's from the xml2 package under the hood all right I, I know that was whirlwind and i know that this is not the final version of this chapter but hopefully you got a um enough of an introduction to kind of watch and dig into it more a lot of this comes from just playing with it um it has been funny writing this these notes and really carefully reading things and going back and looking at some of my old tidy Tuesdays and going, Oh, can't use that one as an example because I did that so bad. Um, and so it works and, you know, there are, you can make it work, but uh, it's worth actually reading through the documentation. <laughs> and hopefully I can get you closer to understanding that. Um, you can so there's the question in the chat is read html live functionality mainly for interactive debugging or does it allow you to do things you can use with standard rvest so as long as chrome is installed on the machine that you're running a script from it can or sorry yeah things you can't use with standard rvest so um it it allows you to do things that you cannot do with standard RVEST. So, you know, that example of if we load, you know, with standard RVEST, if we load this site, there is nothing there in the in this field, versus if we do exactly the same thing with the live version, it has content. Um, uh, because it loads the page as if you're a person loading the page. And if you're a machine loading the page, you don't go through this processing step that would happen inside of your browser. So um, it's, you know, it, it's slower, more complicated and harder to automate, but it's still automatable. You can run these things, you know, in a background job or different things like that. I don't think they work in GitHub Actions because I don't think you have Chrome available. I mean, there's probably a way to make that work, um, but I don't think in the standard runner that it will work. Um, but you can automate uh, even with read HTML live and do really complicated, fancy things. Um, I've definitely done HTML live like with loops where I am loading different or clicking different things and then selecting the data and then click something else and select the data. If I went just a little bit further on this, that is definitely what I would show is um, here where I'm like clicking USA and then you get all the list of things. And I would you know click USA and then click each state within UH USA. And after clicking each one, get the list of data for that state. Um, and then go through and you could go through every country automatically and do that sort of thing. I haven't done that yet because I don't know if they all behave the same because obviously not every country has states or provinces and so i don't know what it does at that point um but we'll uh but again the next iteration will have this i want to try to host all of the data that i scrape like i want to have it on the uh official website of the book but these ones like i don't know i'll have to see if i can set something up that is the other side of this um it's tends to be complicated server logic, or I guess lots of complicated JavaScript, which I could set up. Um, but yeah, anything where what displays on the page, like the URL doesn't change in your browser, but as you click things, the things that display change. That's what this HTML Live is for. And so I think that, I don't remember what the example was, Kevin, but you, you had a page that, you were trying to find the API, you could probably do it with um, read, read HTML live. And yeah, then, it was it was yeah, the um, sorry, it was the uh, the charging stations, I think. And yes, 
that web okay. app, um, or I forget what it's called. Um, yeah, charge, uh, charge point. Yeah, can, no, it's not. It's the open source. Uh, or, right. Anyway, um, yes. Like it, that might be more complicated, and it's still worth taking another stab at actually pulling the or the um, API out of that site. But uh, probably you could do it with read HTML live. Now, when it's click a point on the page that is hard to define with an HTML tag, then it can be hard. But you like um, within the session. Um, do I still have one open? Yeah. Um, so you can say press a certain key. You can say scroll by a certain amount of like pixels, scroll to a certain place. Yeah, plug share. That's right. Uh, scroll a certain thing into view, get the scroll position. Um, and then that's all that really matters out of these. And again, view lets you see the interactive thing to see what your code is doing. Um, way beyond the scope of what we're going to talk about, but the Chrome Oat package, uh, all of this stuff is just pretty much directly wrapping the Chrome Oat package. And so if you can't do it with Arvest, you probably can do it with Chrome Oat, but Chrome Oat is harder, like, you know, more complex to work with. He is intentionally abstracting away some of the complexity. Uh, but yeah, with the, with Chrome Oat, you could even like, uh, I have... Um, somewhere I have a tidy Tuesday where I wrote some JavaScript that gets executed as if I'm running it in the console of the Chrome browser in order to get some data out. And so you can do very complicated things. Um, I like it certainly could be, uh, if not at, at least a long, um, group of tutorials, if not a book of its own. So we're not going to go all the way into that, but it allows for almost anything. Like if you can see it as a person, you can see it with read HTML live probably. So, all right. And that's, uh, that's what I've got this week. Um, I am going to try really hard to have the find APIs done enough for next week so we can keep going. And so um, hopefully I will see you all then. <laughs>